Welcome back, I am John P. Today we're gonna to be answering your questions that you have asked me on my Instagram, The Real John P. From time to time, I post a Q&A story where I essentially field your questions, usually watch related, but sometimes not. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me and I don't respond um, quick enough in the comments below, I do my best, but that would be the best way to reach it. And then I do kind of collect the questions that I think are the most relevant and helpful to you. And I put them in videos like this. So we're gonna be answering a ton of questions today, including things about the Rolex market, things about which watches I think are super hot, as well as so many other questions that I haven't even looked at yet. So truly my responses are going to be from the cuff. Before we do that guys, please do not forget to check out delraywatch.com where we buy, sell, trade watches. We um, are doubling down on our inventory and we've expanded it and so many more watches to come. Uh, at this point, we have hundreds of watches, so I really can't thank you all enough for working with us and it's a pleasure every day to be able to do so. Now on the wrist today, I have a Rowing Blazer Seiko collaboration. I uh, really like this watch, it's fun, it's casual, and that's kind of where I'm at today. I uh, was just enjoying the outdoors a little bit here in South Florida, so you have me here uh, in a t-shirt, kind of a South Florida theme, I guess you'd say, with a matching um, sporting watch to boot. Okay, so let's jump right into it. The first question is Reverso or Tank? So the Cartier uh, Tank, right? Classic dress watch or the Jagger Lecolte, the JLC Reverso. Personally, I like the Reverso, but it has that flip system of the case, which is intended to be used originally for polo matches, right? Um, so that's a little, a little bit additional um, compared to the Tank, which is just your standard dress watch, though very nice and refined. So technically the Reverso is a sporting watch, I like them both, uh, but I lean in the direction of the Reverso just because of that kind of interesting history as well as the usage. Now the next question is, what is the best way to store my watches? The best way to store them would be in a safe or in a vault, right? More secure. But if uh, your watch collection maybe is not to the point where you think that's necessary, depending on just your circumstance, then they have so many different options for watch rolls and cases, but it really depends where you're at. I recommend that you insure them, certainly through either renter's insurance or homeowner's insurance or jewelry insurance, places like Jewelers Mutual. Uh, but nonetheless, the storage, I think it's up to you at the end of the day, but try to keep them secure. That's what I would like to focus on. The next question is, do you foresee the red and yellow OPs becoming desirable collector's pieces in the future. I think probably talking about the red grape as well, uh, which is really a purple. So the, the grape as well as the um, the yellow or the champagne kind of grape, Oyster Perpetuals. I still have the, uh, the grape, you know, the purple dial, Oyster Perpetual. I think they will probably have some following in the future, especially if in the 39 size, because that was a knockout. So many people love that size, especially if Rolex does not come back out with that size and just sticks with 41 uh, as well as the 36, but I like specifically uh, the purple grape. I think that's awesome. There's always a, you know, a collector for something. If they don't come back out with it, it'll be unique and there'll be some following for it. I don't think it'll be you know a million dollar watch because they mass produce them, but still very cool. And in the future, if I had to guess, sure, maybe they'll be uh, somewhat desirable. Next question is, will oyster quartz become more appreciated and collectible? I think, more people will find it unique and interesting, especially as more people start becoming watch collectors. They start hunting and trying to look in that catalog of brands and vintage and find something that's unique, um, especially if more brands continue to copy each other or provide the same kind of a thing in the marketplace. People might start looking to oyster quartz. I mean, five years ago, no one wanted them. Today, a little bit more uh, people want them because it's unique, but the unfortunate issue is the oyster quartz movements you know, they don't produce them any longer and the repair of them can be an issue. And many dealers, when they have a broken oyster quartz, they end up just kind of dumping it out there and putting it out uh, to other dealers as someone looking for a project. And it's always been a headache to anyone that does that. So I think people might really like them, but they are kind of made to break as a piece of electronics and the movement in a way, I know that could maybe be debated in the comments below, uh, but people will like them. I bet because it's Rolex, but there are some intricacies with collecting them and that can be an issue for the long-term serviceability and ownership of the watch. The next question is, are dive watches really the most popular watches? Other than subs, I rarely see in New York. It looks like they rarely see dive watches in New York. Well, I see many people get into watches from the Rolex Submariner. You see the Rolex sub kind of everywhere and it 
For a while, besides the date just, it was kind of like, hey, I made it kind of a watch. You retire, maybe you get a Submariner. I see that a lot in South Florida, um, you know, with a, a little bit of an, an older guy that's a little more retired, a little more senior. I see a lot of Submariners or two-tone Submariners, very common uh, when someone's wearing a, a high-end watch. And so I think people kind of get into it from that way. They see it so many different places. They just kind of get into dive watches. So they get maybe an alternative, right? And then when you start looking at more affordable alternatives to the Submariner, well, then other brands can kind of make that. And that's kind of what I see happened. Um, but I don't know that it's necessarily like the most common type of watch. I would probably say probably um, like a date just alternative or that style of just time, time only or time date. Uh, but certainly dive watches have amassed a following and kind of a cult of their own. So it's difficult to tell, but I do know that they're very hot. People like them. And I believe it has something to do with the Rolex Submariner. Next question is, do a Christopher Ward review? The thing with Christopher Ward is they have so many models and they have so many references and they're coming out with something new every day, seemingly. And I think that's cool, but at the same time, that makes it problematic in that they're always just trying to find like the latest trend. And I don't really see them necessarily trying to lead a trend in any way. So it's like, when you think of Christopher Ward, like what are you, what are we thinking of, right? Like what is their model? Like I know they had a Trident line for a while, they have a field watch, but it seems like they're kind of just making models that other people make and put their spin on that. Now, I don't follow everything that they do, once again, because I do think that they do too much, but many people really love them. We've had a couple in the door at Delray Watch, and I think they make like a pretty good watch. That being said, I don't know that it's a brand I would necessarily focus on, but hey, leave in the comments below. I'd love to see it and hear it. Is there any recommendations of Christopher Ward watches that I should really, really take a look at for you, um, Christopher Ward? fans and collectors out there. I'd love to see it and hear it comments below or in the messages. Next question, should Rolex be, should we be mad with Rolex and their greedy pre-owned pricing move, i.e. Booker? So Rolex is gonna be, you know, coming out with kind of like a pre-owned car program, the equivalent of that in the watch industry. And they're gonna have a stamp of approval pre-owned on Rolex watches in authorized dealers in Europe starting immediately, in the USA uh, starting Q1 2023. I don't know that it's necessarily a greed thing. I think that they are probably, if I had to guess, trying to curb the negative issues that collectors have developed with the brand, right? Leave in the comments below. I see it all the time. Many collectors are like, ah, I don't like Rolex. They don't care about collectors. Maybe they're gonna use this to try to curb uh, some of the flipping. Maybe they're gonna use this to try to kind of put a hold or push down some of the pricing so more people can get into the watches, even if it's in the gray market. I'm not sure, but only time will tell. I don't know that it's necessarily a greed thing because you know there are companies that do need to grow and continue to grow and you know they have labor forces and costs and expenses and you never know when another kind of global issue could happen where they might have to shut down. So I don't know that we would say it's greed necessarily as just companies doing what companies need to do to be a company tomorrow. Thoughts, opinions, love to see it, um, comments below. Next question is, I've been interested in a Pepsi GMT Master II. Should I buy gray market? So should they buy a gray market or should they wait? If you're gonna wear the watch and you'll want it now and you can afford it, I would say go ahead and buy it. Personally, I see that there could be some downside ahead, a little bit of downside in some of the hotter Rolex models. It could happen, but I don't see them, you know, getting cut in half of price. I don't see them going out down an additional 40% from here. It could happen. Who knows what could happen in the world, but I don't think, you know, all things staying constant. I don't think that could happen when we price a watch attractively for a Rolex watch. They do sell. It's not as quick as it used to be, but they still do sell. So I still see the demand there and I still see the willingness of people to pay some premium for these watches, but I wouldn't say, you know, wait and hope, and hope you know, maybe to save another 10%. If you wanna wear the watch now and you're gonna miss out on wearing it and it could go up. So your decision at the end of the day, but if you can swing it, why not? Next question, what do you think about the smooth dial on the Datejust? The Datejust with the smooth, um, I think they're talking about the bezel. Actually, I think they're talking about the bezel. There's different bezel options in the day just over the years, but I think it's a little less flashy than when you start getting into the other bezels that are shiny 
And I do like stainless steel bezels as well. I think out of all the day just, so it's less flashy and that's just personally for me, um, but it all depends at the end of the day do you like your watch to be more of a jewelry piece or do you like your watch to be, you know, more of a utility kind of a piece? Um, but personally, I like uh, as close to plain almost everything as possible. Are green dial watches becoming mainstream among collectors or are they just a fad? I think more people do want a green watch. Uh, I mean, I'm wearing a green watch, but I don't every day wear a green watch. And specifically someone here, you know, one of my neighbors, they wanted a particular watch model. I said, hey, you know, we have this in stock, but then they told me, well, I actually want the green version. So I thought that was kind of interesting because some there's some reason that green has become more popular in watches. Maybe it's the Hulk, maybe it's the Surmet, maybe it's some of the, the more desirable models, I'm not sure. Or maybe it's just the manufacturers started using green and so now people want something different instead of standard colors, white, blue, black. I don't know. Any green watch fans, leave it in the comments below, but seemingly more people are wearing green watches. Next question. What do you think about watch brands like Nevada Grenchen and Baltic? Are they any good? Well, they've both, both of those brands have gone through a lot of different changes over time. Personally, I think the Micro Rotor Baltic watch that they have is very cool and it can be very difficult to get a Micro Rotor watch for the price points that they are offering them at. So I think that's awesome that people can get into cool, interesting nuances of watches that were reserved for very high price points and premiums a decade ago, five years ago. Now it's kind of opened it up. Kind of think of like Zara or like a fast fashion, kind of a similar thing where, hey, Let's uh, you know get some of these things that were reserved for the, only the most expensive watches to more approachable price point watches. And Nevada Grenchen has managed to do that as well. I think they offer some phenomenal pricing. Um, micro brands today are so competitive, including the pricing. I don't have anything negative to say about these brands. So it just comes down to the design. I think the quality's on par with probably most micro brands because they're sharing a lot of parts, manufacturing facilities. I'm not talking specifically about Baltic. They do a lot of things in house, but Micro brands today, they share a lot of their uh, machining in the companies and the part creation process. Next question, what do you think of a JLC Reverso Duetto on a woman? Thanks. I think that's cool. You know, I think the Reversos are awesome in general just because of the history, the polo connection, like I mentioned earlier in the video. But I do think it's interesting that a watch like that, you know, something that may not be as flashy maybe a woman putting it on their wrist, it shows that they like it as a hobby potentially, right? If someone wants to ask like this, this person, you know, they're asking for themselves and they want a reverse. So I think it's cool. Personally, I, I, I would be kind of impressed to see that someone got out of the classic Cartier, Rolex, they went for something a little bit different. And regardless if it's a woman, it's a man, whatever, I just think that's interesting. Anytime I see a Reverso on the wrist, the Duetto, a little bit small, in my opinion. We had one in the door one time at Delray, uh, but still very cool, classic watch. I love it. The next question, what is your opinion on the Porsche design watches? Are they more of a fashion brand? Well, they're definitely leaning on, you know, the auto manufacturer here. They're leaning on that luxury brand. And then you have the Porsche design, all the clothes and the trinkets and the the doodads and whatever else they sell, I don't even know, the shoes, bags, accessories, they're leaning on that, but some of the Porsche design watches are pretty good quality, right? Porsche design, it's not my cup of tea per se. They try to kind of just copy their cars in a way, like the design aesthetics, and I get it, that's the brand, but the quality is there. We had a bunch of Porsche designs maybe two years ago in the door, and I thought the quality was pretty great. And we were selling them for like, I don't know, $1,200 or something. It's difficult for me to remember, but they had the same kind of components in the, the fit and finish of something like a Tag Heuer for a fraction of the price. So I think Porsche Design is putting out some pretty good watches, but unless you really like it for some specific reason, I wouldn't say there's like anything overly compelling about it unless you just happen to like the watch. Next question, is it time to move on from Rolex? Uh, if you like Rolex and you want a Submariner, 
in my experience working with so many collectors, even myself, people I know, people I don't know, it doesn't matter. If you want that Rolex Submariner, an alternative is not going to do it. And that goes the same for any watch or anything. If you truly want something and you've been looking at it maybe online or on people's wrists or on billboards, if you've been dreaming about that thing for maybe decades, if you're waiting for a retirement watch or to save up, a Glashuta original CQ is probably not going to do it for you because you're gonna want that thing that you wanted. So I always recommend if you like it, buy it, but when you get into speculation or getting it because it's hot, it, it changes kind of the, the conversation from, hey, we like these things because of what they are to, hey, we like these things because we like these things and that guy likes these things. So that's where I see it. So if you want to leave Rolex, that's fine. Um, I still wear my vintage Rolex watches, uh, but at the time, whatever I'm happening, uh, whatever I just happen to like, that's what I'm wearing and that's what I always recommend to everyone out there. The next question, what do you think about Hamilton watches, particularly the khaki field in bronze? I think Hamilton makes some of the best quality watches for the money that you can find today. Hamilton, even though they are a pretty notable company, long history, different change of hands as well as you know where watches were manufactured, but nonetheless, they are able to compete on a price point that really only uh, the only companies that can Maybe Tissot, maybe uh, a lot of the micro brands can do this, but they have low overhead. So I think Hamilton is doing really some great work for the price point. They probably were forced to, right? The micro brands probably forced their hand to be more price competitive, but who cares? We shouldn't care. Who cares why they're more competitive on price? We're getting a better deal. And I think Hamilton offers that. So they are a great place to look uh, for an affordable Swiss watch that is not gonna fall apart six months from now. Next question, should I store the papers away from the watches? How about the boxes? The collection is growing. So box and papers, I've mentioned this before. I personally don't care about them. Fine, it adds value. It's nice to hold on to. People like them and it shows history, authenticity, things like that if you had to, if it didn't come from a reputable source. That being said, I have seen situations where there were break-ins and things and no one takes the box and papers. So storing them separately, okay, fine, whatever. I don't know that it's gonna help a whole lot, but what I would actually recommend is take pictures on your cell phone, you know, hold it up, take a picture on your phone of, you know, the warranty card and stuff if you hold on to it. So if anything did happen, you, you have a record of owning it, you have all of that documented, uh, and then you don't have to really worry about the physical copies of all that stuff, because let's say you had to make a claim anyway, well, they're probably just gonna ask you to send in a picture. You know, you're not gonna have to go to an insurance company and dump off the actual box and papers on a watch. So what you do with the box and papers, totally up to you, but I don't really see any kind of like impact on the collection of it. Put it in a, you know, maybe a big Rubbermaid container in case you have like a water damage or something, if that's where you live in. But generally, they'll be totally fine. Next question, thoughts on the Hermes H08. I actually really like this watch and it's unfortunate that they do trade not too far below the retail price. I think they probably should trade much lower than their retail price considering, yeah, it's a fashion brand and people shouldn't like them because historically people didn't like fashion brand branded high quality watches. And I would like that because I would watch videos like this. I would go online, I would read and I would say, oh wow, this." This watch is actually made at like a great factory with a good movement from Vauché or one of the other manufacturers. And so that would be great. It'd be a great way to buy in and get some great horological value for nothing because nobody wanted it because it said the name of a purse company on it, right? But unfortunately, there's so many of us out here making these videos, including myself, so people know they caught on and they are good watches. So I would, Advise against paying retail if you can, because trends happen. Why not try to get a better price? But if you like the watch, once again, it's hard to really say anything bad about them, especially if you like them. Next question. What are my thoughts on the Rolex Datejust Two-Tone? I think Two-Tone is actually a pretty cool look. And present day Rolex models that are Two-Tone, they have 
come so far, I feel like Rolex has with their metallurgy and the way that they create their own metals that I think there's something to be said about having that polished gold metal on the case in addition to the other stainless finishes that it just pops, it pops off the wrist. When you get into all gold, you're saying, hey, look at me, I have a gold watch. When you get into stainless steel, you're saying, hey, I don't really care. But when you have a two-tone, you're saying, I care a little bit, right? I care a little bit, but not that much, but a little bit. So that's kind of where I think, you know, if that makes sense to you, that makes sense to you. If not, you know, maybe another time we'll do a two-tone video, but that's where I see it. And I think Rolex actually does a phenomenal job at their two-tone watches, including the Explorer, which I know is not a popular opinion, um, but that's what I believe. Next question, what are my thoughts on the Tudor Pelagos? Well, the Tudor Pelagos, I think is really a really great watch. I said really a couple times there, but it really is. It's a good watch. When you start getting into the different titanium watches, I like them. I wear a titanium watch a lot of days with my Omega titanium watch. The Pelagos, they fly off the shelves, People love them, and I think it's a true diving, sporting watch, and some of the best value watch that you can get for now in-house movements, especially when you talk about the new Pelagos um, and titanium. So big fan. We'll see uh, where Tudor takes the line. Very excited for the future on this one. Next question, do you rate limited edition models or just hype? I talk about kind of like whatever I want to. <laughs> I don't really you know, talk about everything that's hype, right? Like I don't talk about AP Royal Oaks on here very much. I've done some 5711 videos. I kind of just talk about whatever I want to. You can see it by some of my videos. Some of my videos don't really get many views and some of them get a ton of views because I talk about something that I just happen to want to talk about, like a Rolex model or maybe an AP model, something that's super relevant. But then sometimes I do a video like no one will watch it, but I just wanted to talk about it. So. I do my best to try to make videos that you want to see, but sometimes, yeah, I just want to put a video out there that I like. I don't know, just the strategy I go by and also just kind of how I live my life. So if you have any recommendations, love to see it in here in the future. And I definitely do go through these questions as well to try to make videos in the future. Do you think smaller, lesser known brands like Gerard Perigo will eventually fade out of the market? Well, GP was actually just uh, taken by a management buyout. They raised some capital. Now they're run alongside UN. You know, they're running separately. They're no longer part of the Karen Group. And so I think they have a better chance at ever than becoming relevant because when you're run by the same company that owns Gucci, yeah, you're gonna pump on that thing that's really putting the dinner on your table, right? You're gonna be dumping out Gucci bags and shoes and doing all of that yeah, we'll just forget about Gerard Perigo. We're not focused on that because we're making who knows how much more money. I'd, I'd have to look at the investor relations reports, maybe thousands of times more profit on Gucci bags than a Gerard Perigo watch. You know, worldwide, that's just kind of probably how it plays out. And so now I think there's a better chance than ever for them to remain relevant. And I love to see it because they're hundreds of years old, high quality watches, great designs, and I cannot wait for them to be relevant. I like the underdog, what can I say? Next question. I have an Explorer 2 from 2004 with the double space dial font. Does this hurt the value? Here's the thing. With these, you know, dials on certain Rolex watches, sometimes they can be, they can fetch premiums, right? Like my frog foot dial Explorer 1, like, the Rail Dial Explorer series. They have some of these special dials that especially during the pandemic, you saw them skyrocket with demand, but I don't know that that's going to be a long-term thing. Maybe in the Daytona, because the Daytona is really the precedent for collectible watches. But in all models out there, it's difficult to tell. So for me to say, hey, this one specific version of this, you know, you start getting the air dials and fonts that were a little bit off and, things aligned, things not aligned, things change. It's difficult to really speculate, but generally uniqueness has fetched premiums over non-unique looking at the Rolex watches, even if it's just a little bit of a premium because the guy that wants something unique probably is willing to pay a unique price for it, meaning a higher price. Just my thoughts, but time will tell. 
And the last question we had here is whether or not there are any watches that I would love to handle or to own that I haven't been able to experience in the industry. And I will admit that I would like to handle more Richard Mille watches. I handled a lot of them earlier before Delray Watch when I was consulting in the industry. I handled them a lot more, but the, the product line has really expanded. They've come out with so many things. And this is just not something that we focus on at Delray Watch. We don't focus on those. We focus more on enthusiast watches, the watches that, you know, the watches we all talk about here, right? Uh, you're nodding your head in your homes probably, but you get it. You know, we talk about these enthusiast watch collector kind of kind of watches in a way. And yeah, sure, Richard Mille watches sometimes are bought by enthusiasts, but a lot of times they're not. And that's not always what we handle at Delray Watch. So I would actually love to give them more than a fighting chance uh, to captivate me and to handle all of the Richard Mille watches to see if any of them really grab me. So that's probably the really the, the only watches that I haven't spent a ton of time with because they've just had so many limited edition, special editions, uh, versions of the cases, and they're snapped up like that and they're really traded by a handful of people. So when I do business with those people, yeah, you know, I'll handle them, but spending extended amounts of time, I haven't. So that would probably be my answer. You know, some of the more interesting, unique Richard Mille watches would, would probably enjoy handling them for a while until I get, you know, back over to the watches that we handle uh, and the things that I really love and enjoy. But you never know, willing to give it a fair shot. So guys, what do you think about any of this? Uh, once again, please make sure to check out my Instagram, the real John P. For the future, you can ask me questions, I'll answer them here, and then I also chop them up, right? I'll chop them up, I'll put them on reels on Instagram and sometimes the TikTok. Uh, so make sure to check that out over there, especially if you do have a question and I haven't been able to respond to you elsewhere. Guys, we'll see you next time. You've been chatting with John P.